Welcome to our webinar, Keeping Your Congregation Safe, Tips for Pre Preventing Sexual Harassment. Can everyone see the screen and hear me? Please type in the chat box so that we can make sure everybody can see that the, the slide says per, per sitium. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Nobody else has to type yes. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, my name is Mary Lammermeyer, and I'm the loss control manager here at the insurance board. Most questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, but he will answer some as they come up if it's relevant to what he's talking about. But please feel free to type any questions in the chat box, and if he doesn't answer, if um, our, our speaker doesn't answer them, right then it helps, we'll try to answer them at the end. This webinar is being recorded and can be viewed at a later time, and it's free. So you can you know, pass it on to, to your colleagues, to your friends, other churches, that they can come back and watch it later. Today we are pleased to have Ross Mitchell from our Partners in Protection at Presidium present on this important and trending topic. Ross is an attorney and works closely with Presidium's educational clients as well as other youth-serving youth organizations. Let's welcome Ross. Good afternoon, everybody. Glad to be here with you today. Um, Again, I just want to introduce myself, um, building off what Mary said. I, uh, pr prior to working with Presidium, was practicing law primarily with education-related uh, clients. I currently now work with Presidium on our education team, but I have done some work with our religious services team. Uh, I want to note that the information that we're going to discuss today um, is not legal information. It's not legal advice. You are... Uh, likely have your own legal counsel that you can run some uh, ideas that you may get from this uh, presentation by. Also, each state's laws are different. There are some overall, like overarching federal laws that address sexual harassment and sort of define and, and list protected category, uh, categories, but there are a lot of state level decisions um, in laws regarding sexual harassment as well as some local, uh, local and county regulations as well. So you'll want to consult with your individual legal counsel in your respective uh, states and for your organizations regarding um, drafting policies, what's accept, what classes are protected in your state, which are not. Um, and so with that being said, we're going to discuss some tips for I, not only preventing sexual harassment, but a big part of that is identifying sexual harassment. And so talking about how does this manifest itself in churches, what does it look like, um, how there are some categories that we'll talk about that were kind of the the go-to categories and how this occurred in churches, but there's a, kind of been a burgeoning movement now of pastors also talking about um, sexual harassment that they've encountered from congregants. So we'll talk through some examples of that and talk about just the basic concepts of sexual harassment, and like I said, we won't really get into the laws. Just know that there are federal laws on the topic, state laws, and depending on um, the jurisdiction, some, possibly some county and local laws, uh, depending that, that all, cover all different types of harassment and um, discrimination, etc. So I want to start by talking today about who we are, who Presidium is as a company. We are an abuse risk management firm that's headquartered in Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, largely the the abuse or the risk that we seek to manage and help clients manage is the risk of abuse of abuse and neglect of youth and vulnerable populations, so vulnerable adults. Um, so in that vein, we do a lot of work with uh, schools, as I mentioned earlier, uh, religious organizations camps, uh, social service groups, basically anybody that serves um, vulnerable populations. And so in that vein, we have created, uh, the, well, the company actually was started by our founder who was sat on the board of a nonprofit organization that experienced an incident of organizational abuse. And he set out to find how this occurred, not just how do we react to it, but how do we stop this from happening altogether? And so in doing that, he created the safety equation based on a root cause analysis of 400 cases at the time. I believe now we have 
reviewed over 4,000 cases, and the same operational uh, breakdowns hold true in the 4,000 cases as they did in the 400 cases. And so you'll see our safety equation later on, and I won't really spend a lot of time on that. I, you can check it out on our website for more information if you have any questions about that. Um, so next, we'll talk about sexual harassment, and sometimes there are some discussions of, that we can have about how do we utilize the safety equation that exists for abuse or youth abuse prevention to also prevent sexual harassment. And we'll talk about the different types of sexual harassment, not only how they manifest themselves in churches, but but what they are in general. Uh, and then we'll talk briefly about how to respond. And this one's going to be a shorter section because each one of the, I believe there's 73 attendees, no doubt each one of your congregations uh, may handle this differently or may have policies that are different uh, regarding responding or investigating, et cetera. But we'll just talk about some some overall best practices to to consider should you receive an allegation or a complaint uh, that there's sex, uh, sexual harassment in your church. So as I mentioned, uh, we've surveyed over 4,000 cases. Uh, and now we have roughly the same amount of clients across a bunch of diverse industries looking for a root cause to determine how do we prevent organizational abuse. And um, the good news about this analysis or this type of analysis is that it there aren't 4,000 different ways that this happens. It uh, it largely manifests itself in the eight operational areas that did result in our safety equation. In that same vein, we believe that abuse is not a natural disaster, and similarly that sexual harassment is not like a natural disaster, and that it it's going to happen no matter what. It's all you can do is is react to it. Um, if you implement the best practices in the safety equation, then you don't have to rely solely on responding to abuse. So, for example, in Texas, we have tornadoes, and we can't stop those. We can only react to them. With the use of the safety equation, it is our belief that you can prevent them, prevent abuse altogether. And so briefly show you the safety equation. So the different operational areas we look at, and this is going to be what we use to, to uh, discuss this risk management with youth and vulnerable populations, but this is largely going to be relevant for sexual harassment as well. So looking at policies, does your organization or your denomination have policies on this? Some of the larger nationwide congregations do have policies on sexual harassment or sexual misconduct in their congregations. Um, screening and selection is going to be less of a concern for your organizations because you can't really screen congregants. Uh, certainly you'll want to screen your any employees that you have and possibly volunteers depending on their level of access um, to youth, but that's kind of outside of the sexual harassment context. Uh, training, why this one is important, how it's relevant for the sexual harassment discussion, is you want your, uh, well, training and consumer participation kind of go hand in hand here. You want your congregations to know if you do have policies or practices that speak to sexual harassment or sexual misconduct, you want that information disseminated to everyone so that nobody is operating under the um, or nobody can claim that they didn't know about it. And so some ways to do that could be including a link in a bulletin or an e-newsletter or something to that effect. Uh, monitoring and supervision and internal feedback systems kind of speak to uh, the sexual harassment context and that you know, you're not going to necessarily monitor all adult interactions because that's unrealistic. But uh, you want people to, to know that you're out there, you're looking, uh, or you're seeing and hearing things, and if there is a problem, you're reporting it to somebody or you're telling somebody. Uh, that's going to go hand in hand with responding as well. But like I mentioned earlier, if you want more information on our safety equation or you want to read more in depth about it, it that information is on our website. 
Also, also at the end of the webinar, there is uh, an email address for Christy Schiller. She's our VP of Religious Services. And so any questions or resources or additional information that you think might be helpful, you can reach out to her with that as well. And that email will be at the end of the presentation for you to take down. So before we dive into the, the nuts and bolts of sexual harassment, let's talk quickly about the abuse of or the effects of abuse or harassment on victims. Uh, churches, I don't need to tell you guys this, are in a unique position in that um, things like sexual harassment or abuse that occur in a church can have some different effects on people than what would what would happen in, say, for example, a, a business or a company, uh, because you are dealing with faith and uh, relationships, intimate relationships sometimes, with um, or where a pastor may know intimate details about your life, um, it is it could you run the risk of a parishioner or a congregant or even a preacher losing faith if the organization receives a an ac accusation of sexual harassment and nothing's done of it or it's not resolved. Um, similarly, this could also damage spiritual life. It could cause a loss of trust in the in the institution. It also can have, just like other forms of abuse, negative impacts on other relationships, and it can also cause feelings of betrayal. And with some of the um, some of the examples that we're going to read through later, I'd like you to kind of think about, particularly one some of the real life ones that we'll talk about with um, congregant to pastor sexual abuse, how these could factor into. Uh, someone's response or how they feel about their ability to continue working in that environment. Also, uh, not sure the roles that each one of you play in your organization, but you could, there's a very high likelihood that sexual harassment or particularly rampant sexual harassment could cause lots of focus on your mission and ministry. It could take resources away from, from your ultimate calling, which is um, serving people and ministering also can cause long-term damage to the reputation, uh, cause loss of membership or split up in congregation, or loss of trust in clergy and church leaders. And this is particularly true if the accused or the person accused of doing the harassing is a pastor or a leader in the church. So just some things to think about. Some of the, again, some of the real-life examples I'll read um, kind of speak to that loss of trust in clergy and um, and congregational split up. All right, so now that we've had all this background information, let's talk about sexual harassment. I mentioned that we won't get into the, into the specifics of the laws, but just generally in churches, these are the three ways that it manifests itself. So your quintessential employee and staff harassment. So this would be the same types of harassment that you would see in an office setting if, say, you worked for corporate America, um, that's not largely different than what you'd see in churches. And so we'll do an example of that here in a second. But um, your church may or may not have policies on this, but usually if there are policies, they probably at least apply to employees. They may also apply to congregants or volunteers, but generally written policies will at least apply to employees. Um, and so that's employee staff harassment. Um, you've got pastoral exploitation, which is a type of sexual harassment whereby the pastor exploit, exploits the imbalance of power to manipulate someone into a sexual relationship. Uh, this one is not unique to sexual harassment, but it is kind of a another way that, you know, perhaps if and I don't know how many of you are familiar with our pastoral exploitation course on our training uh, module, Armatus, but you may have seen some of the same concepts in that training module. And there's also congregant to con congregant misconduct. Uh, again, this is going to you're you're going to want to look to your congregation's policies or your denominational policies if you have them, and see what what if anything do we say about congregant to con congregant interactions. And if somebody's having a problem with a fellow congregant, how do we handle that? Uh, if you don't have those those things written in policy, I encourage you to reach out to us um, 
uh, to Christy, and we can chat about about where you can go from here or some best practices uh, for abuse prevention or uh, sexual harassment prevention regarding congregant to congregant uh, abuse. Also, um, as I mentioned, there's a, a growing growing group of pastors out there who are speaking out in wake of the Me Too moment and are uh, kind of speaking out on a new groundbreaking, for lack of a better phrase, uh, category of this, and that's congregant to pastor harassment or pastor to pastor harassment. So I will just read you a couple examples of how this manifests itself. Uh, we do have examples of all the other three, but I want to talk to you quickly about this one. So from a from a male pastor, we have this. After worship, a woman introduced me to, to her friend who was visiting. In front of a group of middle-aged women, she said something like, if my pastor were this cute, I'd find the sermons a lot more interesting. And they all laughed about it together as if I weren't even there. Somewhat innocuous, some would say. Some would find that inappropriate. And we'll, just, we'll talk later about how you ascertain what sexual harassment versus what isn't. Um, another example, this is from a female pastor. My former sexton used to come into the office all the time to tell me how beautiful I was. He'd sit down on my couch and wouldn't leave. Another one, when I was on my internship, the council president would come up behind me in the communion line and rub my shoulders. All different types of of harassment, so you have a uh, physical in the rubbing of the shoulders, you have verbal in telling someone she's beautiful, um, and you also have somewhat of a physical aspect in that the pastor sort of lingered and just wouldn't leave the other pastor alone, wouldn't leave her office. And so uh, I highlight these to bring up across the point that very frequently sexual harassment, not unlike abuse, starts off with boundary-crossing behaviors, and the harasser looks to see what exactly they are able to get away with um, before they determine on who, how they're going to move forward or if they're going to move forward with the harassing behavior towards this one person. And so with all three of these, uh, I think probably none of them are going to make the headlines of a national paper because they're not outrageous but they are inappropriate. And so one thing that we want to think about when drafting policies uh, or implementing policies that we do have is how do we handle these behaviors that are inappropriate or boundary-crossing behaviors? How do we respond to those? And we'll get to that um, short, briefly at the end, but look to, look to the guidance that, that your denominations have if they have it. If not, maybe you can uh, work with a group of of stakeholders to create such policies um, to outline how you would react in a case like this, like these that I just read. So sexual harassment, particularly in the employment context, but also in the other two contexts, manifests itself in two, or there are two distinct categories. There's quid pro quo and hostile work environment. Uh, when ascertaining whether or not something is sexual harassment for the purposes of a lawsuit, the courts will look to whether the behavior was severe and pervasive, uh, whether it was unsolicited or unwelcome, offensive to a reasonable person, which is sort of dependent on the area that you live in, what the social norms are for that area, et cetera. And uh, was there a negative impact on the complainant? Were, were they retaliated against maybe by moving them to a different part of the church or firing them altogether? Or was the person unable to, conti to continue working in the capacity they were working because the harassment was so bad? Um, if yes to all of those mentioned, then the actions or behaviors likely rise to the level of sexual harassment. But it's important to note that's the legal standard uh, or that is the general legal principles be behind sexual harassment, but you you as churches get to set what's acceptable in your congregation and with your uh, participants and congregants. And so 
you can craft policies that are more stringent than this. Um, and I think some some groups have done that by labeling inappropriate behavior and, and things that don't rise to the level of maybe a sexual harassment lawsuit as sexual misconduct or other prohibited conduct. And so um, if, if you are in the position where you're able to craft your policies, just kind of think about that and keep that in mind that that you are able to to require a higher standard of, of behavior with your congregants than just what the baseline legal standard is. Um, and so talking quickly about quid pro quo, that is the quintessential example of quid pro quo is a, su a supervisor asking a subordinate for um, or propositioning a subordinate for sexual favors, i.e., uh, let's go out with me tonight and I'll give you a promotion. And the, convert, the inverse of that, if you don't go out with me, then I'm going to demote you. Um, you normally see this in a supervisor-subordinate relationship just due to the disparity of power between the two parties. But it is important to note that quid pro quo can ex exist in um, co-worker to co-worker sexual harassment. So, for example, if you think back to the pastor example uh, where I gave where the pastor was sitting on her couch and wouldn't leave and the younger female pastor wanted him to go um, if you know if she said I want you to leave I'm not comfortable and they're the same let's assume they're the same level of of employee their co-workers uh, he could say well if you make me leave then I'll tell them about you coming late yesterday so it doesn't quid pro quo doesn't always have to be a supervisor subordinate, but that's just normally where you see this uh, bubble up. So, for an example, Mike is the youth director at his local church. Tina is an assist assistant youth director and worship leader, and she meets weekly with him to coordinate youth activities and plan worship services. Uh, the most recent interaction culminated with him inviting her over to his house for drinks. She declined the invitation. When she arrived at church, she learned that she that he had suggested she be moved from her current position to a position in the church nursery. Uh, I can see some of you chattering. Just briefly, does this rise to the level of sexual harassment? And I'll look at see if there's a couple responses. Um, but then we'll move on. Okay, so we have one person, a couple people saying yes, right? This is a little bit more of an overt example in that she's being demoted, or at least we're assuming she's being demoted from her current position because she wouldn't agree to have drinks with him. So now that y'all have got this down, let's move on to the next category, which is hostile work environment. This one is not as easy to see sometimes, um, both in the behavior that that manifested or that leads to it. Um, sorry, I am stuck on this slide. Let's see if I, oh, there we go. All right, so hostile work environment is a, an environment where when harassment or discrimination in the workplace, or in, for example, if in the church or congregation or church programming is offensive and frequent, pervasive, or serious, such that it interferes with an individual's work performance, disrupts the work environment, or makes the work environment intimidating or offensive. Again, these concepts come from the business setting or a corporate or a, you know, not necessarily a church setting, but churches that have policies on this or many churches that do have taken these concepts and used them for church programming, so um, subbing out work environment for church environment or church function, you know, is basically, does somebody, does a congregant feel uncomfortable coming to, say, a Bible study because these things are happening? Um, and so some ways that that can happen, there are three different ways that you can create a hostile environment or that behavior can create a hostile environment. Um, Physical, so that's unwelcome sexual advances, groping, kissing, unwelcome touching. Uh, think back to the the example of the lady who had her shoulders rubbed. Verbal, so sexual comments, innuendos, jokes, including sexual language references, sexual gestures, 
Um, and then visuals, so sexual photographs, cartoons, calendars, inappropriate emails. You know, you would hope that some of these things, well, of course you hope that sexual harassment is never happening in the church environment or certainly not the church that you work with. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, these things start off small. So it starts off with maybe a, a pinch on the rear or a shoulder rub or an inappropriate comment about how, you know, the physical characteristics of a of a, a congregant or a preacher. Um, and then it can devolve into something else if left unchecked. So we'll go through a few examples here of how this can manifest itself in churches. Now, these are based on real-life examples, changed some names and whatnot, um, and of course don't identify where they came from, but uh, these are things that have actually happened. And so let's talk to, uh, or let's go through this example. So Caroline is a recent widow, and she's been going to, to Pastor John for grief counseling. During their sessions, he accidentally brushes up against her and occasionally tells sexist jokes. After church one day, John asked Caroline to give him a hug and told her that's what all the pretty girls do. Several congregants witnessed this behavior but did not report it. Caroline told the senior pastor about Pastor John's behavior, but the senior pastor discouraged her from confronting him because it might hurt his, hurt his feelings. Was this behavior sexual harassment? What do you guys think? All right, so most everyone reporting yes. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on in this example. So we have verbal and we have physical, certainly. But we also have a problem that maybe a lot of churches have in that we don't want to report it or we're unsure if we should report this. Uh, one thing that you'll want to work with your congregations on if you do have policies and uh, I have a question here about intent. So the question reads, is there an intent here that is difficult to prove? And the answer is for a legal, for a lawsuit, maybe. But for operation and for your, your church or your congregation, is this kind of behavior acceptable? And that's really kind of what you're looking at all of these. That's the lens you're looking at is not just preventing a lawsuit, but we want to prevent this environment from existing in our church altogether. We don't even want it to be close where we could maybe get sued. We want we want a healthy, safe environment that everybody can come and worship and participate in without fear of being uncomfortable um, because of sexual harassment. Is that, okay, I see that that answers the question, great. Um, and so, but what I was saying uh, previously was we want to look at reporting and creating a culture of reporting in our church, and some of that's going to come from communicating your policies uh, about what sexual harassment or misconduct is and how you report it if you see it. Uh, so you don't have to be the victim of it should uh, just to report. If you see, like these other congregants in this example saw this happening, they should be able or there should be a mechanism or a way for them to report that to the church leadership to let them know, hey, I saw this, I don't. it's not okay, um, you know, this is what, I've, I've given you this information, you know, act on it. Uh, so with that, we'll go to the next slide. I think. All right. This is a, a congregant example. So Derek and Bethany go to a singles Bible study every Tuesday night. After Bible study, when everyone's hanging out, Derek occasionally tells explicit jokes, sometimes including obscene gestures. Bethany asks Jimmy, the Bible study leader, to tell him to tell Derek to stop. Derek now re facetiously responds or refers to Bethany as honey, sweetie, and baby when he talks to her. Sometimes he caresses her, her hair, which makes her cringe. Additionally, he makes sexual remarks on her Facebook posts. She's considering leaving the Bible study because she doesn't feel comfortable there. Is this sexual harassment? I think we can all say yes on this one. Um, again, is this enough to to cause a lawsuit or to merit a lawsuit. Depends. Depends on your your uh, jurisdiction, um, the laws in the state, etc. However, is this something we want happening in our churches? No, right? And so when you're crafting your 
policies or you're looking at your policies and trying to implement what you have, think about ways to get the message across that not only is it inappropriate and prohibited for a pastor to be inappropriate with staff or with congregants, but we also expect our congregants to have appropriate interactions with each other. And I like what someone said earlier, that church is a place that everybody should feel safe. And that's the message that we want to put across, is that we're doing this so that everyone feels safe. Um, I have a question here about singles. Um, should we be careful about identifying a program for singles? Uh, you know, it does, it can get dicey because, you know, people from the singles group may, may date each other. Um, and, you know, I guess there it would be important to look at or to consider if you're going to have those programs, um, certainly those are, are useful and have utility and add value for some people. Uh, but we want to look at how are we, how are we doing that safely and how are we doing that? What processes and programs are we putting in place? to make sure that that, is, that that concern is addressed, but that we still serve that need. Because I think a lot of uh, organizations do have singles ministries. Um, this isn't unlike like corporate policies regarding coworkers, uh, coworkers having relationships with each other. Um, a lot, most big or, uh, companies allow it to some extent, but they say, you know, this is, if this is going to happen, this is kind of, the kind of behavior that, at least when you're in the office, or in this case when you're in the church, if you break up or whatever, this is the, we still want to be professional and we still want to create a safe environment for everyone. So we can't have, um, we can't have congregants like stalking each other, for example, or, you know, following them, following someone who's, um, who's maybe been broken, someone's broken up with them, they can't, you know, we can't have you following and joining every single activity that they're involved in. You know, let's let's figure out how we can make that be that interaction appropriate and keep this a safe place for everyone. Does that answer your question? There's Karen. Um, all right, we'll move on just for the sake of time. But we can come back to that one. We've got time reserved at the end for questions. All right. This one is a little bit different, and so I want to talk through this one with you guys, and I know we're getting close to the end, so I'm going to run through this one and then um, have, open it up for questions. But So Adam is the church's business officer, and he has a classical picture of Eve in the Garden of Eden, which contains some nudity. Ephraim, the church secretary, sees it and asks Adam to take it down. Adam ostracizes Ephraim for being such a prude and leaves the picture up. Uh at, when Ephraim again asks Adam to take the picture down, Adam refuses and tells everyone to make fun of Ephraim for being so sensitive. Ephraim's productivity decreases as he no longer feels like a valued member of the church team. Um, so, is this sexual harassment? And think about it, or actually not even sexual harassment, but is actually Ephraim's action or reaction reasonable in this case? All right. So we have some people, uh, most people, saying that his reaction is reasonable. Um, William from uh, Ohio saying no. So I think we can look at this in two parts. The first part is is Ephraim's reaction to the picture of Eve in the Garden of Eden, a classic picture. We can assume it's from antiquity. Uh, probably has some fig leaves in it, in it if we had to guess. Um, is his reaction to that picture reasonable as, as a term, a form of sexual harassment, the visual type that we talked about earlier? Uh, I submit that the answer to that would be no, that in especially in a, a church setting, um, religious iconography and, and particularly Adam and Eve, I think is going to be probably okay, so not reasonable. And some people are saying that, but, and I think everybody's hitting on this point, Adam's behavior after the fact is what makes this inappropriate and what makes this um, environment for Ephraim hostile. So good job, guys. You got this one. You figured this one out a lot quicker than most of my groups have. Yeah, we have some bullying. Right. Good questions, good feedback. 
Um, so let's talk quickly about who can claim sexual harassment. So the direct person, so if you think about the last example, Ephraim was the direct target of Adam's ire in that case. Uh, so he would be the one that could claim sexual harassment. You also have an indirect, uh, an indirect method. So if somebody, for example, let's think back to the to Pastor John and Caroline, where the other congregants heard the pastor harassing Caroline. Let's assume in that example that Caroline was okay with it, but he was saying very graphic or inappropriate things. And such that a, a congregant who it wasn't directed to was feeling uncomfortable and, in a, and it's like not not able to contribute or to participate in that worship service anymore. That would be an example of an indirect target. And again, these are the general legal concepts behind it. But you can make you can define these and make them stricter based on your policies or broader. Actually, the case may be to encompass more people who can make these claims. Uh, but you have the the ability to to impact that. Um, and just the last thing on this slide is some churches have policies that allow volunteers and congregants to raise a claim of sexual harassment. Um, if you are able to develop policy in your organization, you may want to consider doing that just as an extra layer of protection for the people you serve. Um, if you have policies and they don't address that, maybe a discussion, or maybe your organization chooses not to do that and monitor it in a different way. Whatever works for you guys, just know that there are groups out there that, that do extend um, sexual harassment, sexual misconduct policies to congregants, volunteers, staff, basically anybody that's in the church community. And that's, from a best, pra from a best, best practice standpoint, that's really the best practice if you can do it, um, is just to give those protections to everyone because it ultimately helps create a safer church community where everybody can participate and feel safe in that space. Um, some actions that people will take, and we've gone over these, so I won't spend a lot of time on uh, in terms of sexual harassment. Uh, it, the harasser may take are retaliatory, um, retaliatory strikes or adverse employment actions, so termination, demotion, refusal to hire, uh, telling somebody, say you're running a Bible study, telling, uh, in that example we talked about, Jimmy telling Bethany not to come back because she's making too much trouble, things like that. It's not always, doesn't always manifest itself in the employment setting. It can certainly be in the volunteer congregate to congregate setting as well. So you want to make sure that if you do have policies or you do have procedures regarding this, that you address that any type of retaliation or adverse action is is not okay and is subject to discipline. So briefly, um, this is just general best practice advice for everyone. Um, if you receive a report of sexual harassment, refer to your congregational policies. For those of you that have them, they will be your, your guiding light to that. Um, if you don't have them, there are a couple considerations on here, a couple different types of, con of policies you'll want to look at and ensure that you have or, or try to develop if you can. Um, understandable that some things are outside of your sphere of influence, but to the extent that you can develop these, uh, this this helps protect you, the organization, and your and your church community. Um, so policies defining what is harassment and misconduct for the purposes of your your denomination or your congregation. Uh, how do we investigate reports of sexual harassment or misconduct if we get them? Those are largely going to be decisions made by either your congregation or denomination if they have policies, or if you're an independent congregation, by your leadership. Um, and then how do we report this? How do we communicate who who reports, who re, well, what are we reporting and who are we reporting it to? And we don't want just staff to have that information. We want the whole congregation to have that information. Uh, think back to the John and Caroline example. If the congregants in that, in that example had had reporting information, possible that they may have reported Pastor John's behavior and got it stopped without Caroline even having to say something. Um, and so those are just some things to think about. Certainly, if you see the harassment uh, harassment in action, you can stop it. You can you can you know raise an issue with it at the time. Um, but you want to put formalized procedures in place on how you communicate 
this information and to who and what the what the next steps will be. And then, of course, you want to consult your church's legal counsel whether or not you have policies. Um, they're going to be most intimately familiar with the the laws and requirements of your particular jurisdiction, and so you'll want to rely on them as well in how you move forward. Um, like I mentioned earlier, if you do have any policies regarding sexual harassment or misconduct, you want to ensure that both the staff and congregants are aware of those policies through maybe the church newsletter, quarterly business meeting, um, a link in the bulletin, something to that effect, just to keep the information fresh. Um, and so here on this slide, we have some uh, insurance board, some information about our our partnership with the insurance board. And I'm sure that Mary or Christy would be happy to talk to you more in depth about the options and the, the solutions that are here on the, on the slide. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna switch over to the next slide, which gives you Christy's, uh, sorry, she's not director of education. She is vice president of religious services. But you'll have Christy's email address there and you can reach out to her if you have any questions uh, regarding content resources, anything that we can maybe help you with, anything that you see on that previous slide with um, regarding the partnership with Insurance Board, um, she'll be able to, to, to talk to you about or you can contact Mary. So with that being said, I'm going to open the floor for some questions. I want to be respectful of y'all's time and, and get, you, get you out of here. Uh, but if you have some questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, hi, this is Mary. I, I, I did uh, see a couple that were scrolling pretty fast. The okay. one question was, these, the, these three items seem to, to me to constitute abuse, improper forced relationships, uh, um, not harassment, improper behavior, comments, degradation, assumptions. So they're trying. Okay. They're trying to. I guess their question is they're wondering if uh, why is it classified as harassment, not abuse. Right. They don't always live separately. It, it's kind of a gray area. Um, well, particularly for interactions with adults, um, the things that are you know harassing comments or intimidation, like the pastor sitting in the woman's office and not letting her leave, those are harassment, those are harassing behaviors, but they're not at the level of abuse, if that makes sense, of like sexual abuse. If you, you know, rubbing on the shoulder is not really the level of sexual abuse, but it does, it is harassing, if that makes sense. Now, of course, if it goes to a sexual relationship, then that, you know, it still may or may not be abused depending on consent and all that those other things. But really, the takeaway is whether it's abuse, whether it's categorized as abuse or harassment. You just don't want, you don't even want to have to make that distinction. You want to put policies and procedures in place to avoid that from happening altogether. So you want to stop the smaller violations, the the whistling or the the inappropriate comments on someone's looks or the shoulder rubs, you want to put things in place to stop those so that you don't have to get into the weeds of determining or ascertaining what's harassment, what's abuse, because sometimes that those distinctions will fall based on state or federal law, and so you, you, just, you don't want to have to get to that point. You want to stop it um, earlier than that. Okay, the, another question was, is the intent here that it is difficult to prove? Um, similar to that last answer, um, we don't really, we're not really looking at intent because the the viewpoint and the lens that, that sexual harassment um, was certainly with lawsuits, but also that you want to develop for your church when you're looking at the framework is not what was the person who was doing the harassing or, or engaging in this conduct thinking, but more of how did it impact the person who was the recipient of it. And so, um, because you can, some of these things with, say for like the shoulder rub, that could be sexual, that could be not. It could just be a friendly thing, but is it appropriate? Is that what we expect 
of our congregants, or we is that how we create a safe environment in our church? You know, I think probably most people when in line for communion would probably not want to be having their shoulders rubbed by other people regardless of the intent. And so that's why you, you kind of don't look at the intent aspect because it, it also can lead you down a rabbit hole. Okay, here's another question. Uh, somebody's asking, can you go back to the previous slide solutions? Sure. I don't know. And I can leave it on that now. I just wanted you all to have Christy's email. Oh. Um, I see I could, yeah, this I could talk about, about some of this if, you, if you'd like. Sure. Um, the, 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 I was going to talk about this anyway. Um, if, you go, if you go to our website, www.insuranceboard.org, um, you can see these services that go to the Safe Conduct Workbench. And you can see these services, that, um, that the Armadas, to anybody. And there is one on sexual harassment. These other things, the helpline, that's, some, that's something we, that was rolled out um, to PCUSA earlier. It may be extended to other denominations. Know your scores in online self-assessment for um, sexual abuse of children. Model policies and policy analysis. We do have, I wanted to bring up, um, we have a sex, we, there's sexual, sexual harassment section in our safe conduct policy and procedure template, which you can find on on the this website, on that web page. So uh, you should go back to our website and see what we have. We do have some things on sexual harassment to, as resources for you. Um, Mary, I've got some a couple more questions I'd like to answer if we have time. Sure. Okay. Uh, one, question, uh, one question says, I've repeatedly encountered, how do you handle the sexual harassment of pastors and pastor spouses by congregants? Um, this is one that I'm glad you asked about that because this is a developing area and it's it's becoming more and more known as people are speaking out about it. Um, but largely, if you have policies or you can put policies in place that apply to everyone in the church community, your response mechanism will be the same. And so whether that's um, reports go through a deacon to the associate pastor to the pastor, However, those reporting chains work, and regardless of who it is that's engaging in the prohibited conduct, those reports would all go through the same channels. If that answers your questions, um, so it wouldn't report. It wouldn't. It wouldn't matter if the congregant is abusing, is uh, harassing the pastor. If it, you would use the same reporting channel. Of course, that's different, I guess, if the pastor is in, in that reporting chain, and then maybe you can make a workaround for that or craft something like that. But um, but that's how you would respond to it, in the same way that you would respond to any any other uh, complaint or uh, allegation of sexual harassment, um, unless, unless the person in the chain of reporting or who makes the decisions or investigates is also the complainant, then there might be a different workaround policy that you could make there. Um, let me see. There was another question that I really liked. Um, okay, so when there are concerns about congregate to congregate behavior, who should be involved in determining whether the policy was violated and how to respond? And that's going to be largely the same answer is once you've ascertained what the reporting procedure is in your church, then whatever the concer concerns are will go to the person that you've delineated as being the recipient. And then whoever is responsible for investigating will look into it and determine, uh, you know, it, it's hard to counsel, so or to not counsel, but to talk to such a large group about this with such different backgrounds because not everybody's going to be set up the same organizationally. And so I can't really... Get, even give like a best practice of you should talk to have this preacher and this deacon and, and this organizational body because everyone's is different. But you'll you'll need to think about what what how your church or your denomination is structured and how other things that are to, that get reported, who they go to, how do they how do they get investigated, and then you can plug in sexual harassment to that sort of reporting chain if there's one existing. If there's not, then you and your church leadership will probably want to get together and, and develop 
uh, reporting chain. Um, I'm looking. I'm seeing another question about one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so, with with abuse risk pertaining to kids, we deal a lot of the, uh, deal a lot in one-on-ones. And what we say in those situations is probably going to be somewhat similar to what we would say here is that um, if you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with a congregant, naturally um, behind closed doors, if you're counseling them on, you know, say marriage counseling or grief counseling or things that they don't want the whole church to hear, naturally that does or that could open you up for a, a claim against you. Uh, one thing that we always tell people is, uh, or particularly youth serving groups, is if you're going to meet with some, with someone behind closed doors, it's always a good idea to let somebody else in the office know. So if you have, say, there's a church secretary or a business manager or somebody that's there, you can say, hey, uh, you know, my two o'clock's here. I'm going to meet with them in my office, you know, behind closed doors, um, just so that somebody else knows that that interaction is happening. And while you can't fully prevent a false allegation from happening because you are meeting somewhere with the you know behind closed doors, it at least alerts other people in your organization or in the church office that somebody is in, you are there with in your office with somebody, and that way if it questions arise later on, you've told somebody, and so does that mean that? no inappropriate contact or conduct could have happened? No. But if you were had nefarious motives, likely you wouldn't be announcing to the entire organization that you were going to be meeting in your office with this person alone. So that's kind of the best answer I can have for that question. Um, you know, one one other way, and I don't know, every church is going to be different here too, but just the, the setup of the facilities. So if you have, say, the preacher's office has a window in the door or into the office, you know, if you don't draw the blinds, if you leave the blinds open but the door closed while you're meeting with someone, that may that may help um, assuage any concerns because there's transparency and there's some vision and sight lines there. Um, that's, that's a hard one, though. That's a hard one. And so... Uh, you can talk, go back to your your church team, your leadership teams, and talk about that. Say, okay, how do we how do we manage this risk of us being alone? We we need to do this from a from a spiritual standpoint. We have to be able to count to counsel. However, we want to make this safe for everybody, um, and so that may be a discussion based on just the architectural setup of your of your church. Um, you know, physical layout of office space, et cetera, how you how you make those interactions safe. Um, any other questions before I let you go? Okay, I don't see any. So, uh, oh, somebody did ask if they could get a copy of the, the PowerPoint. I mean, it, it is being recorded in, on our website. Um, you can access it. So uh, I just want to let you know, and f you can feel free to have any of your colleagues or uh, churches or friends or whatever can watch it too for free. So you can by doing that, you'd have to go to our website, um, www.insuranceboard.org forward slash online dash learning. Or just go to, if you go to our website, click on online learning, and then go to webinars. And it's recorded. You'll be able to watch it later. So. Um, Thank you for participating in our webinar, and thank you, Ross, for providing this important information. Feel sure, free thanks to watch for having me. It was webinar. Great. Yeah, it was really great. I'm, there's a lot of questions, and it seems like everybody seems to really, uh, there's a lot of thank, thank yous. And so I, I'm, they want to ask if there's a certificate or any kind of acknowledgement. Um, I can, I, I'll send an email, thanks for participating and attending our webinar, but I don't really have a certificate um, I can look into it but uh, right now there's um, nothing scheduled like nothing planned you I can chat with you about that or, or Christy you and I like we okay. can have a chat about that and see if we have anything okay that sounds good great all right well thanks again so um, everybody thanks Ross and I hope you got a lot a lot out of this 
and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.